So hello everyone, I think we'll make a start now. Um, so thank you for joining the, the second session of Transform Health and welcome to today's seminar. So today's event is also part of our weekly uh, SDG4B series as part of the Good Health and Wellbeing event. Uh, my name is Gary Sinclair and I'll be your MC for the, today's talk on Good Health and Wellbeing with uh, Dr. Johnny Walker. So as you may know, uh, Transform Series is a new free online seminar that explores the growing impact of digital transformation on business and society. We'll be covering a total of six areas ranging from the future of work to smart cities, and communities, change and consumer, circular economy and, and many more. So today, however, we're looking at the first of these areas by focusing on, on the health sector. Okay, so we're delighted to be joined by Dr. Johnny Walker, an Australian trained interventional radiologist and international serial digital health entrepreneur who founded the enterprise Jinga Life, which provides a digital health interface through which users can record health information on things like medications, blood tests and allergies, as well as access digital images and records, store documentation and connect wearables. So I think you'll agree that uh, it's very relevant for, for today's world. Um, so feel free to send in your questions during the session using the Q&A function. Okay, so you'll find that at the bottom of your screen. Please be aware that the actual chat function is disabled, so that's a different thing. So only use the Q&A tab. We will then compile the, quest, compile the questions and I will ask Johnny to address as many of them as we can, as we can get through in the time available. So I'm looking forward to your questions and I suppose without further delay, I'll hand you over to, to Johnny. Johnny, you're muted there. Molly, you can unmute Johnny there, please. Molly, can you hear? Hi guys, Gary, if you can hear me, could you give the thumbs up? Beauty. Guys, I'll bat on. Um, Molly, if you could take me back to the first slide, please. And I'll take over now, Molly, if that's all right. Okay, guys, sorry about the first hiccup. We knew that we wouldn't get through this without um, a few problems. This is the first time I've ever presented uh, Prezi virtually. Normally uh, we're flying through um, on a live stage, but look guys, thanks so much for the invitation. I really do appreciate it. And um, Theo and the crew have asked me to talk about uh, the future of healthcare um, from a, um, a digital perspective. And I truly believe it's going to be a consumer led digital uh, tsunami. But the real, real question we're all asking ourselves tonight is, can innovation survive and thrive in this COVID world that we find ourselves in? So what I wanna do is give you a little bit of background of um, where we came from, which was far from COVID in outback um, Western Australia, how we grew um, into an international enterprise and how over the last um, 10 years, we've really been evangelizing empowering the consumer of care and the real captain of care who we call the Jinga um, in a way that they've never been empowered before to help care for the people of the planet. So once again, thanks for having me. I'm gonna talk pretty quickly and uh, let's hope it goes. So my name's Johnny Walker. I'm a clinically active interventional radiologist and uh, nuclear physician. I'm based at the Hermitage uh, Medical Clinic, trained out of Australia. And uh, for those that are already questioning it, I'm an Aussie and I'm, I'm not a Kiwi, but I work with a fantastic uh, team at the, uh, the Hermitage out there off the M50. My background, my dad was a um, country GP, became a country surgeon in a beautiful little wine growing area called the Hunter Valley. In, uh, in New South Wales. And um, he had no technology, no technology whatsoever, other than his stethoscope and the old doctor's bag. And then we had a donkey line to try and find out where dad was. And we used to have to connect to all of the different farms uh, within the valley and eventually to the hospital to be able to, um, to reach him. And God love him, I think uh, he'd be astounded with the technology we have available to us today to help us look for people. I've been blessed on a pretty magical journey um, uh, throughout my career after school. I went off to, um, to Cape Town there at the top uh, and lived at the top at the foot of um, Table Mountain in uh, Cape Town at the Rondebosch Boys High School where I did my rotary year back into um, Sydney 
there as we go around the clockwise, uh, where I did my university and uh, early training at the, the wonderful St. Vincent's Hospital in uh, Darlinghurst in Sydney, crossed to Perth for a pretty magical uh, time on the beach uh, in Cottesloe, and then I uh, had a uh, mentor that kicked us out of the country to centres of excellence around the world. I was fortunate enough to win the uh, sharing fellowship to the Royal Postgraduate Medical School at the Hammersmith Hospital in London, where I saw the first ever truly digital and filmless uh, diagnostic department of its type in the world, sold to the NHS as being cost neutral for a total cost of 28 million euros, um, which no one obviously could afford. But I thought, boy, if this is like the colour television and it becomes cheaper and faster, more effective, more efficient, we'll be able to have this sort of technology in little parts of the world where I grew up in the Hunter Valley. I was rescued up to Cambridge, uh, there in the bottom left-hand corner, um, magnificent year of my life, and then across up to, um, to Stanford, where um, the Americans, as opposed to the English, and I hope I'm not offending anyone in the audience, they tend to pour petrol on you rather than um, water you down. And uh, it was a, a truly wonderful year of, um, of uh, my life where they offered you the, um, uh, the opportunity to come back uh, to America and uh, take up an associate professorship. But in so doing, I had to get out of the States, go back to Australia, get my visa sorted out. And I ended up getting stuck there with um, a bureaucratic bungle. Uh, and I ended up going and doing a locum high up in the bush and these were my first five patients. Um, and my role was to do ultrasounds on um, each of these ladies. And I always say, what do they have in common? My little daughter, Charlie, always said, dad, you know, that's the easy bit. They, they all went to the same hairdresser. And um, look, they're a magnificent breed. Um, they're Aboriginals. Uh, in fact, here we have three generations. We've got um, the grandmother and uh, uh, two, um, uh, Two of three of her daughters and then another uh, granddaughter. Unfortunately, the wrong number of fathers um, for uh, for how all this happened. But my role was to do um, ultrasounds on pregnant Aboriginal mums. Um, with Aboriginal mums, um, they're genetically predisposed to diabetes and um, diabetic mums hang on to the sugar. The sugar goes across the placenta and it gets sucked up by the young uh, little fetus, the developing fetus. And the fetus becomes quite large. And then when mum goes to deliver the little baby, um, the baby gets stuck and we end up losing both mum and the baby during that stage of um, delivery. Um, it's something we call macrosomia, macro meaning large, um, so many, many bodies, so large bodied babies and um, totally, totally uh, diagnostable, diagnostic, um, uh, able to be diagnosed, sorry, ahead of um, delivery. And yet out there, there was just no um, service whatsoever. And I'd come from these centres of excellence where um, we had absolutely everything at our fingertips. And then suddenly I found myself in this magical land um, with the red soil and the blue skies where these people basically had nothing. And so uh, on that particular day, it was 48 degrees. Um, in, um, I did 48 uh, mums out of the back of an old truck using an old mobile ultrasound and a diesel generator with Albie the driver who was responsible as I've always said for a lot of these pregnancies anyway and I saw this um, on the 11th of the 11th 1995 so almost 25 years ago next week um, I saw uh, this image where on the left you've got the perfect picture of a little 18 week gestation and on the right you've got a terrible dilemma of obstetric crisis where um, all of the ingredients of a little baby become horribly intertwined and they form this highly vascular tumour which has got the ability to um, spread around the body and metastasize and ultimately cause mum's demise. And that's called a hadidiform molder pregnancy. In those days, had to be carefully, carefully dealt with, with a full hysterectomy. You couldn't spill any of this into the abdominal or pelvic cavity or else it would seed um, and start spread around the body and mum would perish ultimately from, um, from bleeding into those secondary uh, organs. And uh, so it was a massive, massive dilemma. And I just felt incredibly isolated, well removed from these centers of excellence where I'd been blessed to train. And in those days, the only solution we had was if in doubt, fly it out with the Royal Flying Doctor Service. And the Royal Flying Doctor Service is a fantastic service. It operates over a massive waiting room throughout Australia, but in Western Australia, over there on the left, um, on the Western side of the country, we've got just over 650,000 people living outside of Perth, some two and a half million square kilometres, with Australia being around about 7.6 million square kilometres in total. So WA is four times the size of Texas. It's a pretty big paddock. And um, usually when you throw that up, it puts the Americans um, in, their, in their box, but it's made up of very small isolated communities even to this day, spread over this huge geographical area. So the only way of connecting them from a practical point of view was to try and link them over the 3K copper wire, the old telephone system that we had. 
and try and build a telemedicine network so that they could um, be linked through to centres of excellence uh, so that we could look after them. But it was that particular night um, that I felt this um, glaring injustice uh, where I'd been blessed to work in these centres of excellence and yet out here in the dirt, um, patients were um, getting next to nothing. And so I felt this compelling need to redesign. And guys, I want you to think about this compelling need to to redesign, because although this happened just on 25 years ago, next week, we find ourselves amidst this mass massive, massive challenge on a global scale that we've never seen before. And there's a compelling need to redesign ever in time um, to make uh, it easier and safer, more effective, more efficient to care for people in a different way than we have to now. So at that time, I didn't have any ads up into all of this. And I wanted to build a system that we had at the Hammersmith. I didn't have the time. In fact, I had no money. I was £35,000 um, in debt. But um, I had a very simple telemedicine network so that I could provide an outpatient clinic um, to these um, patients in the bush. I started with a little mobile ultrasound uh, unit, which you see there on the, um, the bed um, and in the box as we put it into the, uh, the truck that day. And um, I just thought, look, we'll start with this little mobile ultrasound unit. It was the first one available in Australia. And um, Toshiba wanted to sell it into the market. They wanted 60,000. And uh, I said 20,000, we settled on 30,000. I didn't have any money. I said, they said, could I pay in 30 I asked days? I asked for 90 days, we settled on 60 days and away we went. And that's how we actually ended up building this little practice, looking after small communities fragmented all around um, Western Australia, driving from Harvey, Colleague, Donnybrook, Bridgetown, Manjimup, Margaret River, um, and offering this service at point of care in a way that had never been done before. So we actually, bit by bit by bit by bit, we built our, um, our little footprint out across the Western Australian um, landscape. Again, all on a copper 3K phone line. Now 3K, guys, I'm here trying to get um, uh, two meg into my, um, into my house. And yet 3K, we were able to link these, um, these little communities. Gary, is this working, mate? Are you able to hear me and everything? Okay. So bit by bit, um, from a 3K network, we went to a, um, I remember we went to 56K, uh, went to 128K, 3, 356, I think it was, 384. And then I thought, oh my God, the heavens have opened up. And then suddenly this thing called the internet came along. And um, that was the release of the handbrake. That was the biggest inhibitor for me, was to be able to connect to centres of excellence around the world. And I was able to open up my, um, uh, my network where I trained in Cambridge and um, Stanford and various other excellence centers of excellence around the world and ask them if they could um, give me second opinions for all of the disease that we we're beginning to find um, in the outback of um, Australia and so bit by bit we built this um, global network which um, grew under the banner of global diagnostics and it still um, operates under that banner today um, I remember we did four patients on our first day three the next day two the next day and I thought oh my god what have I done um, but now global diagnostics um, and its uh, affiliated entities are now doing some three and a half thousand patients around the clock around the world every day and an enterprise I'm really really proud of um, I uh, exited that through a management buyout and I backed our management team to go on and build something really extraordinary um, which they're well on the path to doing and the the night I exited, I think across around the world, we had 469 staff, um, all completely and utterly devoted um, to building something special and uh, changing the way we, um, we care for the people on the planet. But that left me with a real dilemma uh, as the founder, because um, founders, they love being in the, um, the thick of it. Um, they, um, uh, they love, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the real joy of um, and the excitement of building something from nothing. And certainly that's what um, what drove me and particularly in my own field to think that I could have that sort of ambidextrous life of the clinical side, which I absolutely love and passionate about, but also um, the entrepreneurial side to be able to actually go out and um, try and make a difference in what has um, traditionally been a very, very hierarchical, very um, patriarchal um, industry in healthcare. So what next for JW? 
Um, well, listen, I, um, I actually never stopped doing the fun stuff. I always um, maintain my clinical um, uh, commitment. I still, to this day, as soon as this is over, I'm, I've got one more talk to give later on with Huawei and then I'm off uh, and I'll be, um, I'll be reporting and working. I operated all day yesterday um, and it's, uh, I love what I do and I won't give it up because that's where I see the pain points. That's where I see the real, real smash areas um, and real opportunities for us to bring about um, change in a sensible and safe way. Look, I'm not going to uh, tiptoe around this. I'm blessed. I work in a pretty, pretty special, beautiful old shed called the Hermitage, um, which is the mirror image of the Galway Clinic. Um, and it's um, spectacularly beautiful from an architectural design point of view, from a patient flow point of view, and um, from a wellness point of view, it's a gorgeous place to go, even though we have um, an enormous uh, focus on, on cancer patients. Um, but across the board, um, our patients, I think, uh, adore being there and certainly Mary, who I had to do a uh, liver biopsy uh, there on uh, last week when she was sitting out here in the foyer, um, she said, just for a moment, Johnny, I forgot why I was here. And I think that's a real testament to the architects and the designers um, who brought this magnificent building to life and allowed us to, um, to care for the patients the way we do. But I felt that there maybe just maybe there's time for one more disruption because although i'm blessed and i'm working in this magnificent um hospital um i still think the healthcare ecosystem is completely and utterly flawed it's grown up and evolved in a very ad hoc way a very chaotic way and in fact there have been um you know there's a real incentive to stop people coming in and trying to disrupt and change the way we care for people because there's so much inbuilt obsolescence within the chaos of the ecosystem and so i thought how can we go about um, changing that. And you might say, well, look, Johnny, what's the problem? Well, you know, we've got a hospital based system. It's a system that works. I would say that, look, it's still fundamentally a doctor centric focus. And you might say, well, what's wrong with that? And I, and as a doctor, you know, I'd have a hard time defending it. But as a doctor, I truly believe that it's unsustainable. It is unscalable. We know it's unsafe at times, even though we really, really try and be as safe and as um, effective as we can for every patient we touch. Um, but we know it's inefficient in people, time and dollars and incredibly costly. So, you know, is it the best um, model of delivering care? And I don't think it is. And so the solution, it's one thing having a whinge, but you've got to come up with a solution. And I think the solution really is a genuine shift to promoting health and wellness within the community. Now, when you see these slides, guys, I know everyone's out there thinking, oh, yeah, jumping on the COVID bandwagon. These slides have been, um, have been out there um, in the domain uh, you know, for the last five years, um, 10 years, some of them. And uh, I've tried to be able to bring this digital vision um, to reality. And little did we know that it was going to take a virus and a pandemic to actually put us under the um, spotlight. But I think now more than ever, there is this compelling need to change the way we care for people and shift the focus from the hospital to the community, within the community, to the home. And, um, and this is how we can do it. It's just by taking um, the current models, and engineering them in a way that is more effective, more efficient and using digital technology where and when it's appropriate to actually help us deliver that. Now, to some degree, it's still focused around the GP, okay? I think we're gonna see that change, whether that's in in-house visits or virtual visits now with COVID, I think we're going to see the nurse really step up. The community nurse, I think, is going to be the saviour of all of this. The dentists, God love them. If you're thinking about doing dentistry, good luck to you. I couldn't have done it, but God love them. We do need them. And this all-important pharmacy team, not only in the high street, but now with the virtual pharmacies, the ability for the pharmacists now to become an integral part of this digital ecosystem that we're trying to engineer, and the all-important physios. And you'd think the physiotherapists couldn't be a part of this new movement. They absolutely can, and they've been probably the most innovative of the ecosystem in moving to a uh, virtual environment to still engage with their patients. But talking of the patient, where is the patient in this new model? Well, in pre-COVID, they're driving to the clinic, they're trying to find a car park and they're taking a number and they're effectively waiting in line like they would at the delicatessen um, for their sausages. So is this the most effective healthcare delivery model? Um, I would say, look, I don't think it is. And what we really need to do is we need to engage, embrace, enable, empower, and we need to listen and be educated by our people, by our patients, by the users of the system as to how we can make it better. And I deeply believe we can do this now with the technologies available to us in their own home. How? 
just by simple enabling technologies. Each of you have one either in front of you as we speak or in your back pocket and has just mobile, digital, connected, but very, very personalised innovations in a way that we've never been able to deliver before. We can now do it and there's nothing stopping us. And that is a massive paradigm shift. Now, with COVID, this is becoming less and less of a paradigm shift. It's becoming, it was more of a, a necessity, a survival mode that we got thrown into in February and March of this year. But up until then, this was a, this was just a step too far, you know, and people thought, oh, Jesus, Johnny, he's on drugs. And if he's not on drugs, he should be on drugs because this is just heresy that he's talking. But I really believe that we need to have a total realignment um, away from the hospital to the home. And that requires a redesign of the entire healthcare ecosystem, not a complete smash and build from scratch, but over the course of the next two to five years now, we have this very, very real driver um, to redesign and we need to do that and embrace it. And just as we go, I think I need to share with you a really important and compelling um, observation that I had when I come out of my operating theater, when I've operated on the elderly 73 year old man and I walk out to, um, to talk to uh, his um, carer or member of the family, um, I, who steps up to talk to me? Um, but in my experience, the custodian of the well-being of the, um, the family, the gender of that carer in 92% of my audited cases in um, 16 and 17 is the female. She's the gatekeeper, the shepherd, the protector, often the female, um, often, sorry, often the mother, more and more now, the millennial daughter, and more and more now, the millennial son. And now with COVID and now with digital, we're seeing more and more of a democratization of healthcare. We're seeing more of a sharing and equal sharing of the burden across the genders of how we can actually go on and care for um, the elderly in our family. But we call her the Jinga after the African warrior queen, Queen Jinga, um, the great fighter and protector of um, her people. You know, so do we truly operate a patient centric um, service um, pre COVID and even now within COVID? Look, we don't. Where's our patient? They're trying to drive to the clinic with their masks on now, they're parking the car, their system overload. Um, you know, we lack that personalised information. Uh, often the Jinga's voice isn't heard and yet she's the most instrumental and pivotal role and resource within the ecosystem. And yet we talk through her over, we talk in Latin and she feels like she's on this conveyor belt of care um, at all times. So is it patient centric? No, it's not. So my deep belief is that we now need to stop and redesign. But how do we do it? Look, the technologies are there um, and they're not, they're not overly complex anymore. They're off the shelf, they're available, they're connectable, they have interoperability. And that's a, um, you know, a mixture of sensors, just smart IT, workflow, which is designed with lean theory and, and now with COVID on board um, and using simple informatics with a very personalized um, focus, all brought together in a really, really simple way, just like we did with global diagnostics to build something that's um, very real in terms of a new model of healthcare. And I think all of this should be designed and populated by the gatekeeper of care within the family. And we call um, that person um, the Jinga. And I think the Jinga needs to be involved in the design of this new world. And if you had to draw it, and I'm a big drawer, um, I would put the Jinga and everybody she loves in her family, uh, all the way from the elderly parents through to the little kids and the dog, we don't do cats, but everybody in her circle of care from, um, from the nine o'clock mark over there, um, where all the way from conception through all of life's milestones, through the sandwich generation to caring for the elderly parents and to that really, really important end of life. We need to be able to use technologies to facilitate the smooth transition through each one of these milestones while staying connected um, to the GP, the all important community nurse, the physio, the dentist, the pharmacist, um, and the, uh, the specialist, all through the palm of your hand, through smart technologies, so that we can map the, the, the well-being of each, each and every one of the members of our family. And there's my little man, and we've got all of his immunisation and allergies, and now with COVID, the whole vaccination thing is coming alive at last. And so we built uh, an app, a companion app, which is fully GDPR compliant um, and linked through to a uh, medical grade platform, which allows all of the appointments and scheduling, medications, allergies, everything you'd expect to have in a medical app, as well as reports on um, blood tests, uh, the imaging uh, transfer, so you can have your your own um, private film bag. And we built that to the point where uh, we launched this with um, Affidea in the, um, the market in the uh, August of um, last year. 
and uh, very, very rapidly went to um, over 175,000 patients have opted to use that and download their images into their own, um, into their own uh, private film bag. So you might say, Johnny, look, is this really the future? Well, I think that, um, you know, we now know there's going to be 75 billion connected devices um, tracking health by um, 2025. The Internet of Things is upon us. And pretty well anyone who has access to the uh, a device um, anywhere in any context in any domain can now come in and be a disruptor in pretty well any domain. And what we wanted to do was bring Jingle Life with the empowerment of the mobile app, link it through to a digital first aid kit and videos and education to create a solution that might be able to fuel a tsunami of consumer led disruption. And I think it is going to be the consumers that lead this disruption. It is not going to be sadly the politicians. And, um, and I think we really need to be able to um, uh, pour petrol on them in a way that they've never had before. So where would you start? I think you've got to follow the, um, the life cycles uh, from womb to term with pregnancy um, and early life. We can now track basal um, body temperature so we can track ovulation um, to either um, get the wedding tackle out or put the wedding tackle away. And then, you know, with um, as the little one is growing, we can have all of the digital electronic health records available. Teleconsultation, which was only dribbling along there towards the end of last year, is now absolutely accelerated into a, um, into a new world of, um, of uh, virtual consultation where people of all ages now are becoming very comfortable with doing so. And all the way from the young ones now with the various monitoring sensors we have, um, the childhood trackers, um, the immunization which is, as I said, is going to become in so important now with COVID, all the dental records and various other biometrics. And then as they get into the teenage years, they're going to want their own privacy and, um, and all of the data protection that goes with that it has to be mobile. They're going to be wanting to be traveling. And also that mental health side of things along with their, um, their diet and nutrition, their hydration and um, empowering uh, the teenagers in a way that they've never been before. And at the other end of the spectrum, the chronic diseases that are just taking up so much of our people time and dollars, it's where 80% of our healthcare costs are gonna go by 2025 and 40% um, of adults are gonna have some form of chronic disease within the next five years. That's upon us. Diabetes, it's rampant. Half the, world, half the world's diabetics don't even know they're diabetic. And we've got close to 350 million globally. And there's a massive number of technologies coming into the space, whether it's around the, um, the little tattoo, the smart corneas, the glucotrack watches, etc. There's a whole, whole industry burgeoning around monitoring of blood sugar uh, levels and the monitoring of um, and maintenance of uh, diabetic stability. The COPD patients, the smokers, you know, costing us a massive, massive amount of money. How can we monitor them at home? And then the cardiovascular disease, which is still there, um, as evil and as silent as it is. And what technologies such as the Alive Core, the Vital Connect, the Apple Watch, the Garmin, the Fitbit, everything's coming at us. But how do we put it together in a way where we can actually add um, real, real sense and sensibility to what we're trying to do? Don't think that the elderly aren't connected. They're connecting more and more every day on more and more devices for more and more offerings and solutions. They're already using it to build their communities, organize their transport. They're organizing all of their appointments. They're taking their medications and they're wanting to move away from the paper electronic health record. We've actually gone and created a digital first aid kit to actually bring these sensors into one jewelry box, if you like, and then link that directly through with virtual consultation so that ultimately, when a patient goes to see their general practitioner, they could be prescribed the digital first aid kit with the appropriate centers, sensors which are personalized to their brittle diabetes or their COPD or their post cardiac event. And if there's any variation from baseline, it sets, uh, uh, sends an alert through to the Jinga, but also the diabetic care team, the juvenile asthmatic team, et cetera, so that we can bring about an intervention in a virtual digital way, rather than having to bring the patient in or waiting for them, um, which is even worse, to present late into the hospital in the acute care setting. There are methods of um, monitoring with dignity around um, smart beds, smart nappies. These wonderful guys out of uh, Liam Casey's PCH um, kept, um, they built the, uh, the smart nappy, which they then sold for 12 million, would you believe, at prototype level, keeping patients dry in nursing homes so you don't have to wake them up. And in knowing whether or not the concentration of their urine um, indicates that they've been taking enough water to stay hydrated. We've got apps now that allow us to stay active, not only from a physical point of view, but from a mental point of view, and the, um, the beautiful mindfulness apps out there, such as Headspace and various others. And then we hit this 
this stage of life, which is um, the end of life, and that how can we bring technology around to um, have death in a dignified way um, and have everybody in the family linked uh, from a communication point of view, but also after life, you know, not only managing the um, the gathering and the um, the scattering, but also um, uh, the the uh, disbursement of um, assets and wills. Medication compliance is just horrific in the United States. You know, we know that. 14% of chemotherapy um, patients aren't taking their, um, their drug by the seventh week of the cycle. When if they're not taking the drug, how can it possibly be adherent? Everybody now wants everything on demand, you know, whether it's Airbnb or Netflix or Uber or Tinder or whatever else. We understand it all started with um, porn, actually, the whole on demand. Um, but now more than ever, they're having the expectation that they can have their health on demand. They want their medications delivered to the door with um, our Amazon making acquisitions um, in this space. Amazon are now gonna become, you know, the biggest deliverer of, um, of home dispensed um, product on the planet. There, uh, we've got seen various solutions now emerging where we can have dual facing um, dispensing of medications. So no more having to go and visit the, um, the, the, the pharmacist to get your drugs. This is the most beautiful little piece of kit that I've ever seen down at Computer Electronics Show twice now in Vegas. Um, right now we're going through a, um, a little change of ownership, we'll call it, um, but the most magnificent little companion tool that I've ever seen in a home uh, run by uh, voice recognition, dispenses the medications, but it's, uh, it's a magnificent little companion app um, for and, and solution for the elderly who want to live longer with dignity um, within their home. So the benefits, if we get this right, guys, are huge. What's the byproduct that everyone's so, so scared of? Well, it's all about data. And the problem is this data never, ever sleeps and it's everywhere. We've got predictive um, software, not only for the smart ager, but if we could get that through to the primary care team, the acute care team, that could go through to the public health planners and also the payers and the regulators, then we'd really be able to get some intelligence out of this data. Now, the problem is the data is absolutely drowning us. There's a tsunami of data that every one of us is wading through every day. But in healthcare, there's just buckets of it. And you know, when I look at all my um, PET scans and MRI scans and CT scans, any other type of scan, parking the human genome and everything else that comes with in terms of the data load, there's a massive amount of data that we're drowning in, in healthcare alone. And the real challenge for us is to try and extract some meaningfulness out of that data. Otherwise, we're just going on to Dr. Google and trying to come up with um, you know, a solution in a half-baked way. But what we really, really want is that magic bullet. We want actionable data, which is backed on meaningful um, assumptions and analysis. And we're seeing so much of, um, of that at the moment. So look, very, very quickly, a sneaky peek into the future. Now, this was all pre-COVID, okay? So none of this was COVID. And I'll get to COVID in a sec. But you know, VR and AR, it's upon us. Now look, it's not for everybody, um, but my patients at this stage, they love it. It allows us to um, connect with them in a way that we've never been able to do um, from their lounge room and from the clinic. Um, the electronic stethoscope now, it's almost certainly going to be superseded by the butterfly ultrasound, which is as small and um, will now be carried um, by young medical students and doctors in their pocket. The digital thermometer, everyone said, oh, no, that will never work. And now, of course, we're so familiar with um, walking into um, stores and restaurants and et cetera for having our um, digital thermometer done in a touchless way. Young Catherine, again from PCH down in uh, in uh, California, in San Francisco with Liam Casey and the team, this ambulatory digital blood pressure monitoring using radar for, um, for continuous monitoring of the blood pressure. The compression kinetics boys, these guys are phenomenal. Sold to Nike, um, the very smart sock, um, which uh, basically sets up this compression of the calf and stops deep venous thrombosis, also removes the metabolites um, from elite athletes. Gesturing, this wonderful, wonderful team who came over to us from Croatia. So when I'm in operating theatre now and I'm fully scrubbed, I can now just gesture to bring up the images or take the next image or zoom it up or do my measurements rather than having to get my team members back in the control room to do that. The robots, guys, they're upon us and we need to embrace them in a way that we've never done before. They never go to sleep. They very rarely, rarely feck up but, um, uh, and they never drop the uh, scalpel, as I say. You know, this is a, um, a robot which actually um, basically accompanies you from the entrance of the hospital or the clinic throughout the, um, the wards and down to the CAT scan room and what have you. Um, the cyber knife, which we've got in, um, installed out at um, the Hermitage now into its sixth year for an operable brain tumour, where a patient now goes and lies on the table, fully clothed, the camera just goes 
all the way around and the knife actually cuts out previously an operable tumor, which is deeply, deeply related to vital structures. Six minutes later, the patient pops upstairs for a muffin and a cup of tea. And then an hour later, they're in the car heading home. So it's really changed the game for us. The drones, they're here. And we're seeing what Bobby Healy's doing with food delivery now, but the drones are going to be here in terms of delivering um, medications and uh, very and, and all the other frontiers that it's able to, um, uh, to challenge. The 3D printing, no longer do we have to go in and guess once we're in the brain we, to see how big the um, aneurysm is or how invasive the tumour is. We can actually do all of that on the CT and the MRI and then 3D print the tumour so that we can actually practice going in and playing and extracting it. This millennial conundrum where the millennials are coming out, and I imagine there are some of you on the on listening to me now, but we need to basically have reverse mentoring where old guys like me, we need to be able to listen and be nurtured and nourished by the wonderful minds um, that you guys now possess um, in a way that, again, we've never done before. We need to turn it on its head and really pour petrol on you. The machine learning, look, it's going to be a big part of it. It's upon us. I use artificial intelligence every day um, to help me in diagnosing virtual colonoscopy, etc. And the AI and the cognitive learning with um, the likes of Dr. Watson from IBM and the various other zebras and uh, AI players out there now who are really stepping up and, um, and coming to the fore. And I can tell you now, at nine o'clock at night, I am completely and utterly shagged. I haven't eaten, I haven't slept, and I should not be reading PET scans, which are um, absolutely pivotal on a patient's treatment. I would much prefer having the AI and Dr. Watson do the first read overnight and I can come in fresh the next morning. And then collectively, we can come up with the most accurate um, and meaningful diagnosis. The chatbots, they're upon us. We simply don't have enough humans to actually keep us going. So get used to them, embrace them. They'll become better. They'll have, begin to learn empathy and they'll become more personalized and human, but, but begin to learn with them. Blockchain, everyone's so frightened of blockchain, but you know what? It may, may well be the answer to our problems in terms of a universal, and I mean a truly universal global electronic health record, which is owned and curated and collated. By the, um, by the patient themselves linked to all the players. But listen, you think, oh yeah, Johnny, this is all digital stuff. But look, you don't need digital. And this is our little project down in Haiti with the uh, EY Entrepreneur of the Year alumni, um, where we have a little orphanage down on Ilavash, the island off the southwest coast of Haiti, where we have the Madame Boulevard um, orphanage. And we go out and we were just agile, mobile, in the boat, social media was a loudspeaker. And then we do little pop-up clinics um, using a little shack like that. And then within 10 minutes, we started out the waiting room. And within minutes after that, reception desk. Now, I know there's no two metre um, separation there and there are no masks, but this was all pre-COVID. Um, and there are real, real challenges down there now that we're going to have to confront with COVID in trying to protect these people um, from, uh, with social distancing, et cetera. But the patients just kept coming. We just sailed around the, um, uh, the island saying, the doctors are here, the doctors are here. And they came and they flocked. When I look at this, I had to stick, all I was, had left was the, um, the back of a fork. So I stuck it into the end, um, the lateral aspect of this patient's ankle to get the pus out of it. And then when I went to clean the fork in the water, I looked around and there was the dog licking the pus out of the wound. So who needs a CAT scan when you've got a dog? Um, man's best friend. 79 adults, uh, patients in one day, 99 school kids we did for a screening program. Just a truly, truly magic day with all the crew that we took out of Ireland um, down there under the, um, under the program. But look, if we get this right, we can build truly personalised um, preventative medicine in a way that we've never been able to do before. And we can make it simple so that we can stop patients coming to hospital and look after them within their home in a way that they've never been cared for before. But the real question I ask is, um, you know, can we do it? Because it really is so hard, okay? And the problem is, it just gets harder and harder still. And um, here we are, what about the challenges? And these are challenges long, long before COVID ever hit us. You know, our own, as entrepreneurs, our own lifestyle, our professional and financial goals. You know, what are our own personal zero to two, two to five, and greater than five year um, goals across lifestyle, professional and financial? Um, because, you know, most of startups are for profit. How do we build it? And from an external point of view, you're going into a legacy system which is embedded with a patriarchal design. There's so much resistance to change. The immune system of the current ecosystem just attacks innovation. And I know I love, I love all of the crew in the HSC and the innovation they're bringing about, same with the NHS, Health Department of Western Australia and WA. Look, they are trying. They're absolutely trying and they get it. 
but there's still an immune system that attacks um, early startup innovation. And we've got to change that. They're risk adverse in terms of procurement. You've got to have two years of audited accounts to be able to tender for um, something which could be absolutely a game changer overnight, particularly when a COVID hit us in March. Um, there's an anti-startup bias. They don't mean it, but it's cognitive. And they're looking at cost cutting rather than value generating. And we, they see a lot of what we do now as commoditization, where they want, you know, they want more for less, but ultimately the buyers want the lot for nothing. And that's not a sustainable investable model. And of course, there's the politics. And I never mention it because um, I'm politically neutral wherever I am. But you can never, ever let the politics beat you. You've got to keep that fire in your belly. And when, you know, when the, when the hard days come and the deep, deep, dark nights, you've got to step up and step forward. And you've just got to outlast them. And then along came COVID, this global pandemic, a perfect storm for digital health. Or is it? You know, there's never been a more compelling need to redesign some 25 years after I did those scans um, in, in the outback in Fitzroy Crossing in Western Australia. Never since then have I seen a more compelling need to redesign in a way that we've never done before. So we truly need with um, humility, um, without bias, we need to look, listen, design, disrupt, transform. You know, the Stanford protocol, the NUIG Bioacademy protocol, a new world healthcare ecosystem that is sustainable and scalable and safe for everybody in their circle of care and build and adopt and adapt a new model of how we do that. So guys, I'm sorry for blitzing through that, but um, thanks so much. Um, I'll, I'll hop off my little soapbox now and, and thank you all for listening. Cheers. Gary, you there, mate? You want to, uh, yeah, I'm not seeing. Uh... There we go. I think uh, that mute button comes in handy for me. So Johnny, thanks. Thanks so much for that presentation. It was absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Um, and the questions are rolling in and I, I probably have about 20 questions myself. So we'll, we'll see what we can get through. Um, well, actually I'd like to start with just to, just to kind of run through some of the questions is actually a comment, which I think is, is quite, is quite a nice uh, thing that Charlotte has, has wrote. She writes, um, this is not a question, just a comment about Johnny that I met up with him at a DCC event in May, 2011. Uh, I must praise him for his burning passion, which has not eroded all along these years. His thoughts to find new health solutions are viral and should be injected into any health training. <laughs> so I could see where Charlotte's coming from after hearing your presentation. So that, that's, I think that's a, a nice way to start. Um, yeah, one of the first questions we actually got there, Johnny, and it, um, I think you, might, you may have addressed it to a degree, but you might have a chance here to, uh, to extend your, uh, your thoughts a bit further is from actually anonymous is that the question of is there a fear of misdiagnosis if appointments take place virtually or how would someone else's vitals or symptoms be checked sorry johnny you're muted there again molly can you unmute johnny thanks molly yeah. gary you can hear me now mate yeah, yeah. Look, first of all for sharon thanks so much for for that yet, 20, 2011, it seems an eternity ago, but um, thanks for remembering. And look, Karen, one day, please God, we're gonna get there and we're gonna make this happen. Um, in terms of the question just now, is there any fear of misdiagnosis? I don't think there's any, I, I think that's more perceived than real. Um, diagnosis is still to this day, it's 90% history. It's 8% examination and it's 2% investigation. Um, and that was the first thing we ever taught, uh, we were taught, and my old dad said that exactly the same thing. Just listen to the patient, look, and um, what's the most likely cause of this set of signs and symptoms in a patient of this age and sex presenting in this fashion. And if you do that first principle thinking, then you're still gonna be very, very safe in terms of your diagnostic algorithm. Then the technology in being separated and through a virtual consultation, we can do the, um, uh, we can take pulse rate, blood pressure, pulse oximeter, we can do blood sugar, we can do so much now. The only thing we can't do is we can't lay hands on the patient. But listen, just watch that space. There are 
haptic gloves coming out now, which are allowing us remotely, particularly in remote communities, to actually palpate the abdomen of a patient, um, feel the thyroid, um, examine the knee and the collateral ligaments, et cetera, and actually get haptic response um, virtually. We've already got robotics, which allow us um, assist for hysterectomies um, from Australia to Indonesia and Vietnam. So we're going to overcome that technical gap in terms of uh, the fear that people have around diagnostics. I think um, we'll just learn to be better diagnosticians in the virtual context, but I don't think we're gonna be missing um, serious pathology. And still, if we have that concern that look, there's something wrong here, just my gut feel tells me there's something wrong. Look, we're gonna bring them into the clinic and we're gonna see them physically, or we will get them to go straight through to ED, but we'll be able to triage them in a way that we've never done before. Uh, Johnny, just to kind of tag on to that question, just some kind of thoughts for myself, is there, is there a possibility um, of misinformation here on the on the, the patient's part, you know, so if the patient has so much access to, to you know, information online and diagnoses, is the potential there for them reading up on this and then interacting with the doctor and explain the symptoms, is, does that create potential problems in that? Yeah, I think. Yeah, Gary, it's a real issue. I mean, when the patient comes in, like, oh, I was on Google and I saw this and I saw that and uh, I was doing a prostate biopsy on a lovely fella, um, gentleman, yes, say 72 years of age. And I said, um, you know, we can either offer sedation or I think if it's done um, sensibly and soundly, you can get away without uh, sedation. You can just use uh, rectal anaesthetic gel and rectal um, uh, and anaesthesia around the back of the prostate gland um, as yeah. you're doing it. But it's still, it's an uncomfortable test. I'm not denying it. Yeah. But, um, he'd been on Google and then on YouTube and he'd seen all these horror stories. And, uh, you know, I, I had to spend the first sort of uh, seven or eight minutes talking him down off Google, mm -hmm. Dr. Google um, and for him to build, for me to be able to build that um, bridge of trust where he truly just gave himself to me and I was able to do the procedure without any sedation. And he was very grateful. And as he said at the end, I'm not ever looking at Google again. So yeah, Google's gonna be a problem for us. I think Google themselves um, are trying to sort that out to their credit. Um, but I think the more empowerment we give the patient, the more educated they'll become and the better their behavior will be in terms of um, stepping up and taking um, responsibility. Uh, for the healthcare, and that's going to only help um, the whole of the medical profession. Great. Um, I, I'm not going through the questions in order here because I know there's a bit of overlap, so I'm trying to connect them. Um, just connected to what you were saying there, uh, Katrin actually asks, with, with technological advancements, is there a danger of losing the personal collect connection and trust between patient and doctor? And I'm sure that's a question you get quite a lot, Johnny, is it? Yeah, and Catherine, that's, um, you know, that's the big one, isn't it? Uh, you know, do you lose that bedside manner? Do you lose that ability to, um, you know, to communicate, to relate, to build that bridge of trust with the patient when you're doing it like we are now? Um, and I suppose I'm now just one week shy of 25 years in this, and that's the only way I've been doing it for many, many years. And so I deeply believe that you can do it. There is a way of doing it. Um, we're trying to you know, work with the RCSI and Trinity and various other players around the world to actually build that into the curriculum for the medical students, the nursing fraternity, the physios, the dentists, pharmacists, etc. So that we can still have that really special, um, I'll, I'll use the word intimacy, but that, 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 you know, that context of trust and, and have it virtually rather than having to have the patient in the room on the bed. I'll be honest with you, I think for the patient to have to come and wait in a overcrowded waiting room and then come into your room and go behind a curtain and undress and lie on the table and just with a sheet on, and the, you know, that's very intimidating. Whereas if we can um, talk as equals um, in their environment and in my environment and, and, and work together to try and get to a diagnosis, I think you get so much more out of a patient. And I find that when they're in their home environment, they're far more likely to actually share with you details which is absolutely pivotal to the diagnosis than they would have in the short five, six, seven minute consultation they're allowed in the hospital. Yes, yeah, so we're actually developing trust rather than eroding it, I suppose, yeah. And uh, um, so we have so many questions here. I'm trying to get through uh, as many of them as I can. Right. Uh, Chris has a question, uh, again, uh, very highly praised uh, your presentation. He says inspirational. Uh, he asks, who are, the, who are the biggest blockers to this future and how can they be brought on board? 
And just actually a related question to that, because Peter asks uh, down below uh, about how do how did the government react to these ideas? So I suppose that's kind of maybe hinting at a, an issue around kind of government and private sector difficulties there, I suppose. Guys, um, I think the pair of you, I don't know whether your buddies or whatever are doing that online, but there's the, the biggest blockers and how the government responding are kind of, you know, they're, they're kind of coupled. And um, the biggest blocker that I've found is uh, the political agenda, which is completely and utterly unaligned to the care and focus on the well-being of the patient. And look, we've got wonderful bloody politicians out there. We've got a bucket load of Muppets, you know, around the world as well. We know that. Um, and some of them just don't have regard for healthcare. They pay scant um, um, focus to it. Uh, the biggest, biggest problem we have is that we just don't have enough health ministers, prime ministers, presidents out there who are prepared um, I'm sorry about what I'm about to say, but put their dick on the brick and really, really back digital innovation where it's been shown that it will actually create and allow us to capture value in the way we care for people. And because of this three year political cycle, no one's prepared to go out and take the risk. They're very few, there are very few and I could name them, but the, and they've been standouts, absolutely standouts. And some of them, are, uh, some of the, the not necessarily the super intellects of the the medical world, but politically they've just they've had that empathy with the um, you know with the common person and they've they've understood it, they got it. they can see how it would relate to looking after their elderly mum or their elderly dad uh, in their remote home in in um, isolated island. They get it and they're trying to bring about change. but there's this massive, massive um, inertia in in every, public health system I've worked in, in every market around the world that is resistant to that agile, nimble innovation that you need to bring about meaningful change in the way we care for people. Because no one's prepared to take the risk. Everyone's thinking, oh, geez, you know, we can't touch it because if it, if it goes wrong, they deal in possibilities rather than probabilities. The possibility is, yeah, we're gonna drop the ball and there will be, there'll be mistakes and there'll be a learning curve. But the probability is, we are going to fundamentally change the way we care for people. And someone's got to be able at the, in the decision-making unit at the highest level of government and say, yes, we're going to do this and we are going to commit to this unconditionally. We're going to do it. And we're, mm. that's the biggest blocker. All right. That's, that's, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I, now, I will never, I'll never get a government contract again after having said that, but. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask you to name names, there, but I think we can all guess of what, what certain governments you're, you're speaking of. Um, yeah. So just move on in from the government aspect. Of it, and I'd love to talk to you about that in more detail. Um, and they're trying, don't get me wrong. They're trying. It's just mm. got to do it. And we've got to go hard. Yeah. We've got to commit. I, I think you're right in terms of the, the cycles there and, you know, that's, 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 that's a big kind of uh, barrier there. Um, John Dooley asks, um, with the move to online digital consultations, would you expect consultants still to have to work with a, a limit, limited number of specific hospitals or will consultants actually become more like free agents? Yeah, that's a great question. I've never been yeah, asked that. Question, yeah. um, that's a great question. I think we will begin to work in a virtual world. We won't have bricks and mortar practices. Um, like I'm based at the Hermitage because I drive around the M50 from, uh, you know, Dunleary where there's smoke coming out of my computer at the moment and the broadband is, is in tatters. But I go around to the Hermitage, I know it's gonna be 35, 40 minutes to get there, but I know once I'm there, I park the car and then I can, I can operate all day right through deep into the night. I'm not spreading myself around three, four, five different hospitals and then getting caught on the M50, which is a complete waste of time and effort and resource. And I think um, I'm probably very, very close now. I mean, I need to be in the hospital to operate uh, and we use pinhole surgery while the patient's awake and it's a wonderful field of interventional radiology. But for all of the other reporting where I don't actually need to be on the end of the needle or the catheter or whatever, I can actually do remotely as we have now for 25 years. And therefore I can work within a virtual environment and I can be parts of a number of ecosystems as I am 
um, still down in Australia, the UK, Ireland, the States. And I think bricks and mortar hospitals, you're going to be less and less um, locked into that way of practice. Now, for the surgeons, no. They can still do their consultation online, but they're still going to have to be in operating um, uh, theatre. But for the non-procedural clinicians, yeah, I think we're going to move to a virtual world. Mm -hmm. It will mean credentialing. It'll yeah. mean indemnity. And it means all sorts of stuff. And that's the whole a great question because it's a whole new world that I could talk about. And that is that universal accreditation for, um, for our um, qualifications and a universal indemnifier uh, on the insurance side, et cetera. Yeah, that's, it's incredibly complicated. Um, yeah. But even just, just those kind of speaking to those kind of different uh, frameworks and practices kind of moving away from the kind of tradition, traditional kind of structures that we take for granted. Um, some of the questions that kind of relate to that a little bit is that uh, actually Gregory O'Kelly asks about um, like the sharing of information about mistakes and errors. So he talks about the flight industry where they have a really good system there of global diagnostics. Um, he wants to know if the health industry deals with such sensitive issues, in, uh, you know, in the same way, because um, it might be more difficult to admit mistakes, but maybe the, the learnings could make a huge difference in the long run. Yeah, great. That is, I hate bloody people who get asked the question and say, oh yeah, great question, you know, and they're not a bloody great question at all. But anyway, that's a beauty. Yeah, it's the style when you try and come up with an answer. Because... No, you, know, you hear this. Oh, <laughs> I heard you know, Pat Kenny this morning, some guy going, oh, Pat, yeah. that's such a great question. It wasn't a great question, simple question. Anyway, that's a beauty because um, we have, I mean, I'm, I'm fascinated with logistics of aviation, absolutely fascinated, because I think if we can bring the smarts of aviation to healthcare, to run it, in a faster, more effective, safer, more efficient way, then we've got so much to learn. And in fairness, the timeout system, which I use now every day in theatre, is, is it comes from the pilot's timeout in the cockpit, that we go through our checklist, that I'm operating on the right kidney, not the left kidney, et cetera. Um, we've got now the black boxes um, in operating theatres. It grew out of um, New Zealand where we've got the black box and it basically has sensors in the room so that we know everywhere the patient's moved, where that implement went, how long it was in the hand, how deep it went into the skin, how long were they on cardiac by bypass, et cetera. So that we have that data that actually enriches us for when mm. error occurs, we can then go back and we can do a root and branch analysis of where did we go wrong on a no blame basis. Where did we go wrong? How did that happen? What do we need to do to make sure that doesn't happen again in terms of our systems and processes? And then build that into our JCI accreditation, build into our ISO accreditation, et cetera. But the aviation industry has so much to teach us. In terms of putting the hand up, very much in the last 10 years, it's become a, um, a, a, it's a no blame culture. They put the hand up as soon as a mistake is made, step up. Patients are wonderful. Patients are truly wonderful. They're very understanding. And, um, you know, obviously medic, uh, medical litigation in the States, it's pretty big in Ireland as well, um, less in the UK, less so in, the, in Australia, but certainly in the States, it's a different world. But I find that if you make a mistake and you cock up, go and see the patient immediately, sit them down and explain to them what happened. They're very, very understanding. And um, they're, they're on your side because they know that you were on their side, this wasn't done deliberately. And then uh, in terms of data sharing and um, the wrong data going to the wrong person or whatever it else is, put the hand up, take ownership over the, um, the stuff up and fix it. And then close the loop, show that you've, you've done what you said you did and you fixed it. And this isn't gonna happen again. And you're ready and you're watching and you're auditing to see if it ever does happen again. Yeah, that's... Uh, so sorry, everyone, we're getting so many questions here. We're, we're not going to get through all of them. So I'm trying to kind of summarise what's being said. And essentially, I suppose, to say, for example, Tom Foley asks, like, what's next, you know, in the next 12 months? And a few others ask, like, what, it, it, specifically in the Irish context, what, what can we look forward to seeing maybe in the next, the next year or so? Yeah, I think the big one right now, because COVID smothers every other question right now, everything in the, in the near field has to be in the COVID context. And um, we need to have rapid access to rapid um, testing for, um, uh, for, the, for the virus. Um, we need to know uh, who has immunity. We need to build the um, immunity passport, the vaccination passport, which then will hopefully allow um, for entry, not only into business, but social um, arenas, et cetera. And most importantly, 
to get the aeroplanes and transport back up and running. So that's going to be the big one. Near field, rapid access, rapid result. And when I talk about rapid result, I'm talking down to sub 10 minutes, ideally five minutes, you know, 300 seconds for a response, just like a pregnancy test. It, if the blind goes blue, you're positive, okay? And um, so that's going to be really important and that has to be um, near field in the home, okay? Then that has to be through low energy Bluetooth or RF coding back onto your health passport, which can you can carry in your, um, your phone. Um, and from there, that's linked through to a larger um, health record, uh, which ideally is, is universal. And yeah, the vaccination, just, obviously. Just even touching what you're saying there, uh, Johnny, uh, about uh, like universally, um, a few questions kind of like bring up this point of how I suppose the technologies can be, can be applied to all countries, you know? Um, as part of, I suppose, these SDGs in terms of, I suppose, you talk, for example, you talk about um, democratising healthcare, um, but I suppose one could argue that people who have access to these technologies actually bridges the gap potentially further, you know, to play devil's advocate. And I'm just wondering if you could maybe finish up by, by kind of speaking to, to that kind of uh, um, issue. I suppose so, the disparity and in, in, in equality maybe between public and private or between, I suppose, developing and... Um, yeah. Rest. Ironically, ironically, uh, Gary, the third world developing company, countries where I've been um, in terms of Haiti, in terms of Ethiopia, in terms of outback um, Australia, um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, um, ironically, they've pogo-sticked us uh, they've jumped us on technology mm. so you will see them in their you know in the Masamara down in the um, Serengeti um, walking around with all of their traditional garb on a bicycle with um, pieces of wood in the spokes and yet they'll flip open the latest Ericsson <laughs> smartphone so from a technology point of view yeah. they've actually um, jumped us from a software point of view and from an ecosystem point of view there's still a big lag but mm. What we don't want to do is get the technology in ahead of the basic care. Once the technology becomes the, um, uh, you know, the benchmark, that it becomes the pace setter, then you will have huge disparity between the haves and the have nots. What you want to do is be able to bring it in so we're as democratised as possible and then bit by bit by bit elevate the level of care for everybody, whether it's first world or third world. That's a big yeah. ask, a massive ask. Yeah. But, you know, until we address it, until we have a pop at it, we'll never know. I just think it, I suppose it's 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 always going to be an issue, but I suppose it has to be at the, the kind of forefront of the design thinking uh, around. And um, we're actually running over time now. I have to apologise to everyone that we have so many questions, which is which is great to see. I'll try to kind of summarise the questions that have a bit of uh, overlap. And um, before we wrap up here, I just think you'll all kind of um, agree with me that we can thank Johnny for for taking the time to give us like what is an amazing presentation, and to thank all of you who came. Um, to to get serious numbers today for your participation. Um, so for those who are interested, there are more sessions this week uh, on Transform Health uh, taking place at the same time, uh, right up until October 30th. So for example, tomorrow we have Professor Tio Lin from uh, DCU on the topic of social media. And then on Friday, we have Professor Stephen Daniels and Ken Cahill of Silver Cloud uh, Healthcare. And they're going to be doing a session on contact uh, tracing and privacy. Okay, so uh, as well as that, the Transform series overall will continue on November 16th with Get Started. So we'll be circulating uh, registration details uh, around that through the usual .lab channels. So yeah, I just, Johnny, there was a, a, a lot of questions were just actually praising your presentation and your enthusiasm. So I think you've kind of um, inspired a few ideas and a few conversations as well. We just didn't have time to get to that. Um, yeah, Sorry, I, I meant to remind myself, um, Guys, if anyone's interested in um, coming on and being a digital marketeer and an e-commerce member of our, the e-commerce team, or only tiny, um, listen, you've got my uh, my Twitter handle, or get it off Molly in terms of my email. It, it's uh, Johnny at Jinga um, dot Life. And if you're interested, um, look, I'd love to have you a part of it. But you've got to be passionate, you've got to deeply believe, and you've got to be pretty special. There you go, mate. Thanks very much, Johnny. Really appreciate that. And uh, thanks for taking the time. So thanks everyone. We'll we'll, we'll leave it at that. And uh, um, whenever we wrap up these things, whoever's in control will turn it off. <laughs>